How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. You want to leave all that in? That was good stuff. They need to know how unprofessional you are. What's, what's funny is I've been do, like at the beginning when I first started doing these things, it was much more like rigid. And now I'm like, what the, f it doesn't, you know what I mean? This is like the night before you go on holiday, isn't it? Cause you've been doing all these award stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you were saying, this is the last one I have to do. I'm so excited. It's over. Well, I don't mean, no, no. First of all, it's a privilege to be up here doing stuff Sorry. like that. No, it, it, sincerely. It, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but no, it's like, it, well, I'm, I'm he so. He actually said, I'll quote, he said, I'm, I'm glad the last one is with you because it's, it's a nice way to go out because it's all started with you at Comic-Con. Was anyone at Comic-Con? Oh, so you guys know. Yeah. Um, what you don't know, at, so we do. I do a panel called Directors on Directing, and at last summer's uh, Comic Con in Hall H, uh, we've talked about this on camera, but a lot of you might not know this. Uh, he was gracious enough to do the panel. We also um, had two other great filmmakers on stage. And what people didn't realize, it was a 90-minute panel. And um, what, as we're backstage about to walk up into Hall H, you look at me and you say, uh, I've got time to go to the loo. And I said, you can either go into where the fans are all the way at the end or take the elevator upstairs. And all of a sudden we realized we need to be on stage. So. Oh, OK. Uh, so, yeah. So basically, <laughs> I, I'd already needed to pee myself a good half an hour earlier because I had a headache. And I, was, and I thought, OK, if I get hydrated, it will go away. And they gave me this massive bottle. And I didn't want to carry it around. So I thought this, the obvious solution was to drink the whole thing and throw it away. And then I was like, I really need to pee. And then we go on stage. And I thought to myself, it's a 30-minute Q&A or something. And it was 90 minutes. And an hour in, I was genuinely, if you ever watched the video, you might catch me doing it. I was looking under the table to see if there was a banner <laughs> so that the crowd would see if I was actually urinating my trousers. <laughs> Because I was like, it's just going to come out. It's just coming out. And there was a banner, and I sort of was like, I'm just going to do it. I had dark trousers on. I thought I'd get away with it. And then, th then, then thankfully, our clip came on. And I felt it would be really rude to go to the loo during someone else's clip, because it's all like no one had ever seen it before stuff. Our clip came on. And it was the thing you dream of. You're going to show the first. It was the bit from the tank battle, one, the five, ten minutes from the first ever clip ever from your movie in Hall H in Comic Con. And I had to run to the urinals. And, and, and when I was there, I was peeing, and I could feel this fan or someone come up with a poster and a, and a pen for me to sign it. And he was just hovering here, and I was like, I'll do it in a minute when I'm not like. <laughs> and, and then you're, you're signing that, and I can hear all the crowd, and you can hear all the sound effects, and you're like, this is so how it always ends up happening. <laughs> like, like, you dream of some scenario, and the reality is like over here. Like, uh, that panel uh, was so fantastic, and everyone loved your footage. And that was the beginning of, I mean, the buzz on the on your film from that moment became. Anyway, people loved it. And if you uh, ever see video, Louis Leterrier was supposed to go to the bathroom, but he went to the front row to watch the footage, and then he freaked out. Anyway, it was a fun day, uh, jumping into tonight. So. Um, since you've made this film, I feel like AI, we all talk about AI, but it feels like each day AI is getting stronger, more powerful. And I look at the videos of AI from a year ago with like movies and what they're doing now. So how do you feel about AI now versus when you first made it? And are you also nervous about AI in Hollywood? I'm not nervous at all because when AI takes over humanity and kills everyone, they're gonna leave me alone because I made a movie that was very empathetic. <laughs> and they're gonna be like, he's okay, he gets us, leave him, he's good. Um, so that's the main reason I made the film. Uh, but yeah, it's genuinely, look, I'll say the positive side of it, right? If I was a young filmmaker, um, starting out my career, wanting to make films with this technology appearing, I'd be so excited. Like, it looks like it's going to be a very liberating thing for a lot of filmmakers, even more so than CGI, C, CJ, CJ, CGI uh, in the early 90s, you know, was for filmmaking. Um, it's, but anyone who tries to predict what that's going to actually do for the industry right now, if you play back any, any thoughts, you know, in three years, you're going to look like an idiot because it's, it's going to unfold in ways you can't possibly tell. But, um, 
even just the open AI stuff that came out two days ago, whatever it was, was like, oh, here we go. This is it. Like, it's, it's, there's no going back. Because the other stuff you could kind of go, well, it's, there's problems and it doesn't quite, you could pick it apart and say maybe it'll never get beyond like usable footage. And now it just feels like, hey, like this, that, that graph of dots each week, you expect it to plateau. And just every single week, it's like, no, it's still going, it's still going. And it's going to probably go to where everyone predicts, which is it's going to just change the world. It's it's uh, it's crazy, and you know you look it, and it's an, it's a such an exponential growth in its ability to learn. Unlike you know you look at the original iPhone and how long it took to get to where we are at now. And with AI, I think it's you know you're going to be in ten times the speed. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> it's I don't know. I mean, there's so many things to say. It's it's like when like when the automobile was invented. Um, people who own stables were like, you know, it's going to be okay because because now we can get the hay delivered quicker. And you're like, no, 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 there's not going to be horses. <laughs> like it's going to change so drastically. And so I hope, I just hope what it mainly does is, is because one of the things stopping um, great storytelling to some extent is because films are so expensive to make. You have to be like very broad with your appeal, right? To get back the $100 million investment of something. And so um, typically films with this sort of scope and ambition have to please everybody in the world pretty much. And, and if it only costs you $10 to make a film that looks like Star Wars, that will change everything. Do you know what I mean? You'll be allowed to take the kind of risks that you know, it feels like the filmmakers from the 70s were allowed to do, but with, with blockbuster style um, subject matter. And I, I just get excited about that. There's lots of ramifications, but there always is. With any, you know, electricity, the internet, computers, you pick your technological breakthrough, there's massive repercussions. And then the other side of it, we all look back, and I think no one would want to go backwards and not have electricity, you know what I mean? And, and not have computers. And so... I hope it's going to be like that. Like it will be difficult for a while for a lot of people and probably even me, you know, like I do think it's, it looks like it's this doing the sort of thing I do for a living <laughs> by just typing something. So maybe I'm, I'm out of a job too you know, at some point, but. What you did with this film and the visual effects and what you were able to pull off with the budget, it, it really changed what I think uh, Hollywood movies can do. And so I've joked about this with you in the past, but I'm being serious now. How many people, other directors and studios and whoever, have said, how the F did you do this? Can you please show me how? Um, and I say there's some really good uh, DVD extras on the on the Blu-ray that you can check. No, they. <laughs> it's only twelve ninety nine in uh, Amoeba Records. That's the only place that sells Blu-rays anymore. So good luck with that. Um, so yeah, no. Basically, I, it wasn't so much me, but my producer and the visual effects artists have had a lot of calls and had to go to a lot of meetings and talk about it. But not I haven't really. Nobody loves me. <laughs> I, uh, that's shocking to me, but I would imagine it also, I mean, you must have done meetings with different studios or talking to people because you made this at a fraction of what it should cost with the visual effects that, but it looks like just such a bigger movie than what the cost was, even though the cost is still a big number. Yeah. And I think we basically, okay, so we, we did loads of, uh, different approaches to make this film and I'll list a bunch of them real fast, as fast as I possibly can. Okay. So we shot it on... Uh, a camera that's only $4,000, and we didn't do that because of the price tag. We did it because it's the only camera in the world that is uh, lightweight and also can shoot in moonlight. It's so sensitive to light. Can which, you can you sort of, it's just the FX3 by Sony, yes. and you can buy it at Best Buy. Do they sponsor you? No, but I, <laughs> I just want to tell people you can literally buy this camera at Best Buy. Yeah. And so, but it had an old, it had a 1970s, what you call an anamorphic lens on the front. So a film, a lens that's basically used with films from the era that I grew up loving, because I wanted to have that look. Um, as soon as you do that, you can then have lights that are really um, small to light big scenes. And so we had LED lights like that were battery operated. As soon as you do that, you don't have to have them on stands. You can have someone holding them on a pole like you do with the guy with the, recording the sound. And so the, I, you could move around with the camera and instantly they could relight the scene 
or in the DOP would be talking to them through a little microphone and earpiece and they would quickly reorientate. And so we would shoot like 45 minute takes and do an entire coverage of a scene in one go rather than stopping and starting, which is more of a classical way of doing it. Even the dollies shots, you know, where you basically, you didn't have to ride the dolly. There's a there's an iPhone that can be stuck to a to a monitor. And as you move the iPhone or the monitor, the camera does exactly what you're doing. So you don't have to sit on it and operate it. So now it's really lightweight. And so you can you can put it down on the ground, do a dolly shot, and then be like, okay, let's move over here and do one. And so like 10 seconds later, you've got a brand new dolly shot. And typically that's 10 to 15 minutes on the film set. So it's all these little silly things when we were making the film. And then in terms of the visual effects, the same sort of stuff was going on in that we didn't want, I didn't want anybody with those what I'd call pajamas with dots on. You know, like when, when you watch the behind the scenes stuff and, and you've got motion capture suits and things like this. The problem with those for me is that you're committing to that guy, unless you're making a film about a pajama party, you're sort of committing to that guy being a robot. And, and then te you tend to watch that footage back at the end. And some shots, they're just their shoulders in shot or their little elbow. And now you've got to spend $20,000 or whatever it is. To, to make this out of focus elbow become a robot that no one's gonna notice. And, and so it's like, okay, what if we don't have anybody with dots on and we just shoot everybody as if they're human and then in the, in the edit, we will decide who's gonna be a robot, who's gonna be AI and we'll do that months from now. And we did the same thing with all the design. We, every single scene in this movie, we went to a real world location. So we never did like, you know, in a studio with a load of green screen stuff. It was all like, okay, so for instance, the, I pick my scene like the lab, the underground lab where they find Alfie. Um, that was uh, we basically. I was we were in Thailand and I was like, "Where is the most technological looking location in Thailand?" Well, you know, they they give a few examples and it, there must be something a bit more. And they were like, "Well, there is a particle accelerator," <laughs> and they were like, "But you will never be allowed to film there, like especially what you want to do." And I was like, can we go visit it? It might be inspiring. Like with a, and they were like, no, well you, no, no, no. And they could see what was unfolding. And they were like, no, you can't go. There's no point in going. You won't be allowed to film there. But anyway, they, they eventually they were like, okay, you can go look around it. So we go around the particle accelerator and we're talking about what we want to do. And they say, they're like, well, we have really expensive equipment here. It's millions of dollars. What, what exactly is it you want to film? And we'd be like, well, kind of soldiers shooting lasers and explosions and, <laughs> And like loads of scientists dying and stuff. And they, and they were like, yeah, 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 not gonna happen, right? And as we were leaving, you could see the cogs turning and they were like, what film did you say this guy had done? And, and this is when I realized that everyone who works in nuclear physics uh, is, is, is a sci-fi fan, right? <laughs> And, and, I was, and they were like, oh, he did this uh, Rogue One Star Wars movie. And they were like, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> And they were like, we'll let you film on one condition. It was like, okay. And they were like, we are in the movie. So everybody that's wearing a white coat in that whole section, they're nuclear physicists for real from Thailand. So. Is it, is it the person who's saying, uh, who's talking and swearing, but it's saying something else? Okay, I exaggerated, right? There's the, the people saying scripted lines. So the lady who's screaming at them, she was an actress. And the guy who took the fall was a stunt guy, but everybody else, the people behind that are grabbing things and trying to help with the blood, they work there and they're, they're like, they work in a particle accelerator <laughs> on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but on Tuesday they were dying and <laughs> from AI <laughs> escaping their lab. The thing that like, I really want to talk about is the fact that movies before this had not been able to do what you're talking about, which is just shooting practically in Thailand and then deciding in post that will be a robot, that's AI, we're just going to erase that, we're going to add this. Movies don't do that. This is the, the first one that's done it on this scale and this kind of scope. Can, can you sort of talk about that? Well, it just takes a lot of faith from the visual effects team, as in whatever company you're using. And I was... I'd worked with Industrial Light and Magic on the Star Wars films and I have a lot of friends there, but there was no part of me that thought they would ever agree to do this. Um, so we were talking to other student, like other visual effects places and trying to think, oh, do we start our own visual effects company? What do we do? How are we going to do this? And, and then ILM contacted Kiri Hart, who's the producer on the film. Who, she's best friends with the lady that runs it and was like, how do we get to do this movie? And she's like, you won't want to do it tonight. Like, it's crazy. 
And they were like, no, we want to do it. And so I went in and tried to scare them off. And I was like, we, we basically don't want to tell you what any of the shots are, right? You need to blindly agree. Um, we're going to go off around the world to seven different countries like Nepal and Indonesia and Japan and shoot this movie. And then we're going to come back, edit it, and then design it then and decide what the visual effects are. But you've got to say you're going to do them all as the studio won't green light it. And they were like, OK, like crazy idiots. And, <laughs> And so then we, that's what we did. And, and so a lot of um, all the design, James Klein was the production designer and we would, I would literally press, God, I forget that, shift, command, and what, is it four? To print screen on a Mac, right? Or something like that. And I was doing that loads with the playouts from the edit. And then I'd be giving it to James, go, we're gonna paint over that shot. And so then we'd be just adding like monolithic, crazy buildings to things. And we found that, Basically, if you what they tend to do on these big films is they get nervous that the director is going to change their mind or change the camera angle. So when they build a crazy thing, they build it for real in 3D from every possible angle, just in case. And it costs like 20 times what it needs to. On this, we were like, we never, I guarantee we'll never see it from any other angle than this shot. And it'll look like this. And then, so then they would just basically take that image and basically up res it, you know, basically make it look photo real and then project it onto simple geometry and that would be it. And and so shots that would normally take a month were happening in like a few days. And they started, they were like, oh, this is good. And and th and everyone got more and more like, like believed in the process a bit more. And so like by the end of it, um, like we did probably, there was like big, when the film finally finished, Oh, actually, we went to show the movie to um, Industrial Light and Magic when, um, at the because there's always a gamble as a filmmaker. We did an edit, the film, the assembly edit, and before we then do another six months of editing, we were like, should we show ILM the movie so they get invested in it and care and understand what they're doing? It would make all conversations a lot easier. But what if they hate it? Like then it's a, it would really backfire because we need them to like go for broke. And so, so I went up to San Francisco and we hit play on like an, a, a version of the film that just had text for everything. And it was a really nice font. It was Futura, <laughs> and, which is the best font you can have. And yeah, it wasn't Arial, <laughs> you know, spared no expense kind of thing. And then, and then essentially it, it ended and they all turned around and they'd been crying. And I remember thinking at the time, like, oh my God, it's worked. Like, this is the first people I'd ever shown the movie to. And I was like, oh, it's working, this is fantastic. And then as I was going home, I was like, wait a minute, were they crying about the number of visual effects shots? <laughs> and then like, so it was at the end of the movie, when it was finally done, there was like family reunions. People hadn't seen their kids for like six months and things like that. It was very heartwarming, like. Uh, I don't know if the version you showed that day was the five hour cut. Was it the five hour cut? No, the, so the assembly was five hours. Uh, which makes it sound like there's five hours of stuff worth watch. There isn't. There's a reason it's not in the movie. But there is, there, it, 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 at about two and a half hours, it got difficult to like, it's like a game of Jenga where it's like, we've got to pull stuff out. Because you do test screenings and um, a bunch of, you know, basically you show it to 500 strangers and then they tell you a load of things that you don't want to hear. <laughs> and and then you have to try and make it better for the next screening. and. And one of them was, it's just a bit too long. And then it was a bit like, so what would you take? I mean, every time you ask someone, what would you take out? They're like, oh, I don't know. And you'd be like, should I take that out? And they'd be like, no, you got the need that bit. But somehow we had to get it down to two hours. Can, so here's the thing, and I'm curious about this. I understand there's a lot of people out there that want love a 90 minute movie. There's a lot of people that are like, two hours is pretty good. Every minute after two hours, for some people, it's too long. And then you have people like me and I'm sure people in the audience that are like, fuck, let's have the three and a half hour cut. You know what I mean? Like, So m my question is, uh, was it your decision to do two hours? Was it the studio saying it's better if it's two? And like, wh how do you feel about, you know, ever doing an extended cut? I'm asking a lot all at once. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm in the camp of 90 minutes is a great amount of time to tell a story. Uh, I, there's a great quote by a film reviewer in the UK, Mark Mode, who said, uh, Stanley Kubrick managed to tell the story of the beginning of mankind to us evolving into a god in two hours, 10 minutes. If you can't tell your story in the same amount of time, you're just not trying hard enough, right? And so I, I, I feel that 
essentially, so the studio were very supportive. They were, they were a dream to work with. It was more these test screenings. Like we just had to get a certain level of like thumbs up and it seemed to be duration. But I think once the film comes out, they asked us, do you want, do you want to put deleted scenes on the Blu-ray and all that stuff? And I said, no, because if we ever do an extended edition, I don't want people to have seen that stuff. Do you know what I mean? I want it to be fresh. I don't want it to be like, oh yeah, I've seen that scene. You know what I mean? Because I was gonna, I was really gonna come at you tonight for not including deleted scenes that I know you have, but I will accept it if you is there, if there's a possibility of an extended cut at some point. But there has to be people have to want to buy it. That's the problem. So, uh, how about um, a, a special one-off screening with Collider at some point in the future? If ev if you sell every ticket for a hundred thousand dollars, the studio will agree. <laughs> They'll be right up for that. My question is, like, you had a two and a half hour cut that you seemed happy with that you need to pull down. Was that a two and a half hour cut that was, like, basically done where you don't have to do much work to it? Or is that, like, a cut that you still have to finish certain VFX so it's not really done? There was a bunch of VFX towards the end that did get cut out that were done. Um, and it's a painful email or phone call. However, we did it. I can't remember. But, but it's, no, yeah, we were doing zooms with everyone, so it was like, you have to f tell them. I'm really so sorry, but it's a typical thing that happens on these big movies because it's a moving target, and everyone's trying to just build the thing. You know, whilst it's still wet, they're trying to sculpt the concrete, and it's you know you're going to make mistakes and stuff. But the um, what was the question? Sorry. Basically, like, uh, did you have finished, like, the two and a half hour cut that you had that you showed, how close was that to, like, a done, wow. done cut? It wasn't, because there's no music on it. We had temp music on it. We had, um, like, basically, if you ever got, you couldn't just release that thing. That's what I'm, that's You'd have to, like, give it some love and, and finesse it. And, and also, the second you decide a scene's not in the movie, you just dump it. Like, you don't, you don't go into the dailies and try and get the best version of that scene. And so there are scenes that if they came back in, you'd be like, you'd want to spend some time really... We'd, this is a pointless conversation because <laughs> it's never going to happen. This is, this is the nerdy shit that I like to dig deep on because at some point in five years, if there's not a, a longer cut, someone is going to research, well, what did he ever say about the deleted scenes or what... You know what I mean? I, I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. Maybe two other people in the audience. But anyway, uh, what was the lat? There we go. There he is. What was, what was the lat? That's my dad, by the way. <laughs> uh, my last question about deleted scenes. What was the last thing or two that you cut out before picture locking and why? So I tell you the, the brutal way we did it. This is all way too much information. You shouldn't know how the, uh, how the sausage uh, is wait, made. Wait, I'm going to pause. Who wants to learn this information? Okay. <laughs> So we, okay, so let's imagine you've got, let's just pretend for argument's sake, you've got a two and a half hour film that's got to become two hours. Let's just pretend for a second. I was blessed with uh, Hank Corwin and Scott Morris were my editors. Hank Corwin was my hero. He did, if someone said to me, what's the two best edited films ever made? No, sorry, what's the best edited film ever made? I'd go, I can't answer that because there's two. One is to me, JFK, and the other one is The Tree of Life by Terence Malick, and he edited both of those. So um, he's a bit of a god. But we would sit there and go, um, and we try, we do a pass. Okay, let's try and take stuff out. Let's just take, let's go through each scene and take stuff out. You take, oh no, I can't take that, I can't take that. You do it, and you get through a scene, five minutes, say, of stuff, and you go, how much have we took out? And they look, oh, hold on, 10 seconds. <laughs> and you're like, oh man, it's impossible. So then we were like, you know what? We gotta do this a different way. Let's just build the film from scratch. So without looking ever at what the film is, just start saying things to put in. And so we built it from like a 10 minute film, like a trailer to like a 10 minute and then a half an hour. And then eventually we got to an hour 45 and we were like, that's the movie. And then it was like, we got 15 more minutes we can put in, oh, thank God. And then we were like, don't look, because if you look, you'll just think of a million things. Like j without looking, what do you miss? And we all went round, there was three of us, and we'd say, I'd say, look, these are my things I really miss. And I miss that, I miss that, oh yeah. And we put them all in and got really close to two hours. And then we're like, okay, let's just watch it. And then if there's any big regrets, and there was like about five shots that we really regretted and we put them in. And then we were like, I think that's the lock. And we showed that at a test screening and it went 
those are the best one we'd had. And so that was the movie. And, and, it's, and, and also like, it's not like we had another month to play around. These things are like, there's deadlines. It's like a sport and the referee blows the whistle and that's the, that's the score, you know. I'll stop there with that line of questioning. So what does it mean to you, though, with all this work you put in for uh, the film was nominated for best sound and for best visual effects? Uh, I mean, genuinely, uh, I mean, we had, we had an interesting journey with this film, we'll call it, in that when we filmed, like, the whole world, it was the pandemic. So there was a lot of things we wanted to do that we couldn't, you know, and everyone's wearing masks and having tests and you can't just grab people and use them. You've got to do a test four days earlier and whatever it is. Um, and then it came to the premiere. It was like, oh, it's gonna be a great celebration. And then this, the strike happened and the actors couldn't come and they couldn't do any publicity. So I could, didn't get to see them. You know, normally you have a like a big gathering again and you're on this little world tour and it's a nice little fun reward at the end of the film. So there's none of that. And then I was like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to buy 50 tickets at the Chinese theater on the opening night and I'm going to invite all the actors to come and we're just going to sit and watch it with the, with the every you know normal audience and just hit. And so I did that and then I was all excited. It was a Thursday, I think. And then I landed from the publicity tour. I was like, my throat's a bit sore. <laughs> and then, and then I, like, oh, I did a test and it's like, fuck, I got COVID. <laughs> and then I just started to feel worse and worse and worse. And then, and then so basically I was in bed all week, the opening weekend of the movie. So, so it was like, it's, def it's this frustrating thing. So having this happen at the end now is, is a really nice, like, I just feel really good about it for everybody. Like, you know, the, and it's also both sides of the spectrum. It's the visual effects, which I think, you know, is basically the visuals of the film. And over here is the sound. And so it's not just one element. So I, I take a lot of, I'm very happy for the whole crew. Everyone, I think everyone should take ownership of that. Um, Cause it's, um, everyone worked really hard and we couldn't, we could never have a party. So I'm hoping everyone gets really shit faced at the Oscars. <laughs> I saw a photo of you and your cast at Disneyland. Oh yeah, Madeline. So Madeline, it was her birthday, and I can probably say this now. I didn't want to admit it at the time because, but basically, I was with Disney doing publicity stuff, and it was Madeline's birthday. And I said to her, "What do you want? Get you anything? You know, because she's so good. Just tell me what you want. You can have it." And I was like, "Just don't ask for a horse." <laughs> <laughs> but um, and she goes, "I want to go to Disneyland, right?" and I want to go with my family and everything. So I was like, okay, great, that, we can totally do that. So it's like, okay, we'll organize that. And I mentioned it to, to the Disney people, just like, oh, we're gonna go at the weekend and go with Madeline, it's her birthday. And they were like, well, we can sort that out for you. Like, we're Disney and you can have the whole VIP everything. And so basically we had this amazing day where it was like John David and Madeline and me and their family. And we just, we just went around on all the rides and we were allowed all backstage and, it was like a really magical thing and they hadn't seen each other since the film. And so it was, uh, it was very, very sweet. Yeah. And I, and I, and I'd never been to Disneyland and, and that was my first time. You got, you got spoiled. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it's always like that, right? You just go straight on the ride, just push bash people and isn't, that's normal, right? What did you, I have to ask you, this is not in my line of questioning, but did you get to go on Rise of the Resistance and what did you think? Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, it was, it, I only get recognized in context, right? If I am out of context, i.e. out of this room in a minute, no one ever goes anything, I never get recognized. It doesn't happen, never, ever, ever. When I was in Galaxy's Edge, people were like, are you Gareth? And it was just like a really weird thing where I'm like, I'm like, okay, I guess they're in a Star Wars frame of mind. Um, so we, it was, it's amazing what they did, right? It's stunning, um, absolutely stunning. I love it. But I am also a sucker for the original stuff. Like I was really, I really liked Pirates of the Caribbean, and 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 all the old school things. Like there's a lot of, I don't know. It's just there's something very. I'm really like my favorite TV show is the Twilight Zone, the black and white ones, and yay, <laughs> and um and I have an old vintage television that can take a HDMI lead. And I sit and watch, I don't really sit and watch, it sounds like a waste of my life, but I have it on in the corner and it plays MeTV, do you know that channel? 
it's basically all vintage television from the 60s and 70s, whatever it may be. Um, and and I love it. It's like a window into another world and it feels like better storytelling because it's it doesn't feel like it's from my life, you know what I mean? It's from some other time, like another place, you know? Yeah, I think it's it's funny that you never went to Disney and then you experienced Rise and then Pirates and because it, it, they're just so, I mean, it's just so polar opposites, but I'm really blown away by what the technology and what they did on Rise. And um, I mean, the park is amazing. Are you sponsored by them as well? I wish. I mean, it, 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 I really wish. That would be amazing. We were outside. He was like, look, I've got, a, I've got hit Best Buy. <laughs> I'm going to, it's my kid's birthday at the weekend. I get free tickets if I can mention Disneyland. <laughs> I, if only my kids in, uh, consist of cats and if I could bring them to Disneyland, amazing. You know what I mean? Amazing. Uh, so listen, you get a lot of credit because you are the, the creator of the creator, but there's so many people that worked on this that are, you know, they don't get the limelight. So you can't talk about all of them, but who's like an unsung hero, someone that was really instrumental in the making of the film that you just want to give a shout out to here and just, you know, to say thanks for what you did or just point them out to the audience in the film and the people that, and you know, the people watching. Oh my God, there was loads. We'll be and here all day. You cut the end credits short. So you could, cut the end credits, sir. <laughs> he was like, he was like, do you want to do you want to do the end credit? But they're like ten minutes long because because there's so many people who work so hard. Yeah, um, I know. Listen, and that's what I'm saying. Just obviously, there's so many people who helped you make this I movie. Would, I would okay. There's loads. So Jim Spencer was the producer on the film. Um, Kiri Hart helped develop it. Uh, James Klein was the production designer who basically everything that's pretty damn good in this film visually went through his fingers on a Wacom at some point. Um, the whole of the ILM team, the whole of the other vendors as well, maybe this is worth pointing out. There was nine other visual effects companies, maybe 10, I get the numbers wrong a bit, but they that, that came in at the end, we had, I was, there was a very naughty director that worked on this movie and he promised he would only have X number of visual effects shots and he went over. Can you believe that? <laughs> and so, so um, we had to get some help in right at the end and these all around the world, it was like every single continent and country, people would do like 50 shots, you know, or so and and ended up zooming with them all and getting to know them all and they all did a phenomenal job and they all matched the quality of what ilm had done like ILM did the majority of it and so maybe they're the unsung heroes is is all those vfx vendors yeah i think they're doing construction at the theater in case you're wondering about the noise don't uh, worry it's just a drill <laughs> That joke comes around every 10 years, and I had to grab it, I'm so sorry. No, I, I, I almost want to mic drop there and just walk out, because it's never gonna get better. Um, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, so when you think about the shots in this, there are so many visually stunning shots in this. Which is the one that you, that was the backbreaker? The one that you kept going back to, or the one you felt like, we can just do a little better here? If, if, it, if the, so we would shoot, so everything that is in the movie that's, you know, is, it's got a piece of footage that it started with. It was never like, here's a storyboard, try and figure it out, or here's some green screen. It was always, here's an actual piece of footage from the jungles in Thailand or somewhere, Cambodia, wherever. Um, uh, and we want it to look like this, you know, it was, and so the, the most successful ones, the ones that I really love were kind of really easy to do in a weird way. And so you're only really like, like cracking a whip on the ones that are really hard to do. And they're usually hard because we didn't do, we didn't give the right foundation for the shot. And so I love what I absolutely love. The things I'm most proud of in this film is things like shots like the little old, well, the old robot that's giving a little kid chocolate at one point, or sifting through some seeds, you know, some grain, or the stuff you never, you would never see in a movie normally because when you put the price tag on that shot and then everyone's trying to like make the budget cheaper, they're like, what, what is that given any, that's not part of the story, you know what I mean? It, but in my opinion, it's like, it's the world building, it's the texture. And and in a, in a drama, you would never hesitate to do something like that. But in a sci-fi, 
you it gets like everything becomes really contrived and and specific and 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 we always joked is that the film was supposed to feel like James Cameron and Terence Malick had had sex and had a little baby <laughs> and and they would never do that. That, that. that could be the headline of the Collider article. <laughs> Joking? Not really. It'll be the article to copy and paste from your, your website. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Lovely. Uh, one of the reasons I think that it, the movie looks so incredible is because you did so much, so much practically and like, um, and I, I don't mean to, I didn't think I was going to actually do this, but you, do you remember the movie Real Steel? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me go with this. So one of the reasons why the robots look so incredible in that film is that they were done. Some of the robots were built practically, and they would have CGI the arm moving. So you can't tell that the arm is CGI, but the rest of the body is practical. With your movie, so much was done practical that when you're doing some CGI in the scene, it looks amazing because everything else is really there. Like, can you, basically, I'm just sort of bringing up the importance of having such a practical base for this film makes everything else so, un, it just makes the unbelievable believable. I'll say thank you, because, yeah. Um, but the, I do feel that we get a lot of credit for the world building of the film, and really half of that is just going to the world to start building, like rather than being in a studio and doing it all against green screen. And so there's so much you get for free that you would never think of. And and half the deal with the crew was when we go to a village or we go to the, you know, the beach or somewhere, don't close it. Like don't stop people, like let people come and go, let them be. And we were such a small crew visually. There was a lot of people hidden around a corner. But if you saw us, we were like five people, you know, with a camera, it looked like a, like we were YouTubers or something. <laughs> and so people were just, I was really paranoid the whole time we were filming this, I was paranoid people were gonna be taking pictures and putting it on Instagram and going, I think I've spotted a Hollywood film being shot in Thailand and and, and it would spoil it. We can get one, well, not one post from anybody because everybody just looked at us and went, well, this looks like, you know, a student film or something. Well, five people is a student film. And it's not even a student film. A student film could have 20 people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was trying to not... The, yeah, it was kind of just trying to keep all the, all the realism, all the detail that you get for free. Like, I don't know. Like they, so the guy, there, there's like shots, like there's a guy in, on a bike who's a robot in our film, right? And he goes past and it's just a little montage you bit when on the bus. We, if you try and organize that, it will cost a fortune. Like you've got, okay, which bike do you want, Gareth? Here's 10 bikes. And you go, oh, that one probably. Okay, we've got a stunt guy to do it. Cast the stunt guy, okay. Okay, we're gonna close the road and we're gonna film it. And instead, the way we would do it is we would just stick the camera outside the car and we would drive on this straight road and we would just look for bikes. People drive, and there was really a guy with bananas just driving somewhere. And it was like, okay, catch up with him. And the driver would just catch up alongside him. We would just film him. And we didn't need a NDA signed because he's going to be a robot. So he doesn't, he has no idea he's in a film. <laughs> and so, so then he would just drive off. He didn't know even filming him. Like I just, he, he didn't look around and see us. So um, there was stuff like that a lot where it was just that, just the, when you don't direct something and you've got someone smoking or just half asleep or bored, I get really excited, like, oh my God, if we can make them a robot, I've not seen that before. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like robots in films are always like front and center or, or being robotic, you know, or AI-ish. And, um, and I just wanted them to be sat and like a little bit fed up and why are you filming me? You know, like some of my favorite shots are like Alfie just playing with other kids and she's obviously a robot thing, but they're just like having fun and joking. And we, cause we would really go to a real village in Cambodia and have her just play with the kids and shoot it. And, and then you'd find this little beautiful moment and go, okay, ILM, make her AI. And it was like, but the problem is that when you do a big movie is, is like, you know, the normal way is you, is you would be, they'd want that 10 second moment to be contrived. And it's like, and action. And there's the 10 second moment and laugh, Madeline. You know what I mean? Like, Okay, and cut, we got it, moving on, you know, whereas you can't get a real authentic moment like that. The better way is, 
okay, kids, just play, for f figure out a game, why don't you play this game, just go for it, and just film them for like 15 minutes. And you just go in a minute, something beautiful will happen. Oh, there you go, there it was. And you, you don't, you're not telling them what to do as it feels false. And, and that's, I don't think, it's very hard to do anything original in science fiction or with visual effects like this, but I think that's probably the bit we, I felt where, like I had, I can't quite think of a film that was really doing that. Before, you know. Like I said, I'm surprised more directors have not asked you how did you pull all this off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But well, I'm telling you, I just spent the last 20 minutes telling you, Stephen. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're not listening. I'm sorry. Uh, what I'm sure that you learned, like as you went in post production, like the first day of visual effects and when you started versus where you are at the end, it was a huge learning process. I'm sure for the for the animators, for you, for what you could accomplish. So how did you notice? that the like the VFX and what you were doing at the beginning versus the end were different like or better or like how did the learning curve go or was it always the same from beginning to end there are certain shots where they have to like there's there's a long time before you get a good one and then you'll get good ones from then on and the obvious one to talk about would be Alfie um, it took a long time. They have a schedule which is like, look, to hit the release date, you need to have all of our visual effects by this date. We've got 400 shots of Madeline, Alfie. Therefore, you have to start, we have to approve them on this day. And you basically have, you have a VFX producer, uh, Julian, on our team, who has a massive chart. And it's like, you have to final uh, 200 shots this week, you know, it'd be things like this, which basically means you have to say they're done, put them away, that's it. And and so there's this pressure every week, as well as editing the film, it's like, shit, we gotta do 15 finals today. Like we gotta so solidly sign off on 15 shots and we gotta do that every day for the next six months kind of thing. And and that is on top of what is the film? You know what I mean? And it's this, this is like the track is going right in front of the train every, all the time. and. And it's it's exciting, I guess, is the, maybe a nice way to say it. But it's also it makes gives sleepless nights to a lot of people. Is it like when you're editing like that and you and you are in the trenches? Is that a six day a week thing? A five day a week? Is it a seven day a week? It's a seven day a week thing. Yeah, honestly, it's like you get home about midnight and then you have to leave about eight the next day for like for a whole year. It's like that. You might get if you get a day off, it means you're at home doing work versus you're in the studio, in the in the edit suite doing work. You know is, that, I mean? is that the way it's been on all your movies? Uh, it ends, it goes a little bit like that, yeah. Because there's never enough time. And you always feel like you end up, these are all bad analogies that are gonna go on the internet, so I have to be really careful. <laughs> but there's always like, there's always something more you could have done. You know what I mean? You never finish a film and go, I if, if I had another week, I wouldn't know what to do because it's perfect, you know what I mean? You're always like, oh my God, there's like a hundred things I want to change or get better. And so it's really hard to just go and just watch a film or have a pizza, you know what I mean? When you're sitting there like, it's like being a surgeon knowing there's people dying and you're like, I got to go back to the hospital. Um, you know, got to save someone. Do you, because L Lucas is famous for going back to Star Wars and making adjustments. If you, are you the type of person that if you could go back and look at Rogue One or Godzilla or whatever, any of your previous films, that you, if you had the ability and money, would you go in and make tweaks? Or do you sort of feel like it's done, it's out, that's the movie? No, I, I you know, I don't look, I can't watch my films. I don't do it. Um, and if they, they sometimes they turn up on the TV for some reason, or, you know, and you go, oh, well, and it's like little nice, oh, that's cool. And I watch a scene and they go, oh God, and I turn it off. <laughs> because it's just like, I don't know, there's it never, you always just see all the things that are wrong with it. And, but it's like going up to, I'm gonna use an American analogy here. It's like going up to Tom Brady and saying, are you happy with that result? What if you, you know, could you go back in time and have a different result? Like, yeah, you'd, but it doesn't work like that. It's a sport. Well, with digital editing and, w I mean, Luke is, again, famous for going back and adjusting Star Wars. So my, my thing is, you know, in five years, I mean, honestly, if in five years, if New Regency, whoever said, hey, do you want to go in and do something with, the, with that extra footage? Would you say, yeah, or would you be like, the movie's a movie? I would be very open to the 
some of those ideas in the sense of, but the problem is, is that it would take like a year of your life and then you have to go, do you want to do that or do you just want to make a new film? So there's always that dilemma. Like, do you want to spend that year finessing this thing that you've done before or, but maybe with AI, it's all going to get a lot quicker. <laughs> and AI will just go, I've done it for you, Gareth. Here it is. That's the thing. Do you think enough people on the planet have watched like I look at, I was gonna, oh, I was gonna bring something in. Uh, I can't say that. Uh, if you, you think like, like you look at the Terminator, James Cameron's the Terminator, and I truly believe that the military is thinking about Skynet in a positive way and not in the negative way of what could happen. And I, I think these movies that are made for entertainment are also warning lessons for the planet as to what can go wrong with AI and with science and stuff. Do you think enough scientists have thought this through? I think, I think it's a symbiotic relationship. I think that, especially with science fiction, I think science fiction inspires scientists and science, and I think science inspires science fiction, blah, blah, blah. And so it's this feedback loop, and I think at a certain age, you watch a film, you watch a film like Star Wars, and you go, okay, am I gonna try and join NASA or become a filmmaker? And you have a dilemma, <laughs> and you pick one, right? If that's what you love, and we, one of the highest compliments at the end of the film, um, I, I think it's okay to say this, is I got a, a really sweet email from Boston Dynamics, who are the people that do the uh, robot, uh, robotics, really advanced, like the most advanced robotics. Sure. And they were just very sweet about the film and said like they really liked the fact it was a positive robotic AI story um, because Hollywood always does usually the opposite. And, and, I, and I, we talked about Boston Dynamics so many times whilst making this film and wondered what they would think of it, you know what I mean? And since so suddenly that email to land, I called, like, I called my production designer up. I just, like, it felt like, you know, there's little things you go, if that ever happened, it would be worth it, you know, and that was one of them. I read that you did your own sound effects when you were shooting the creator, you know, going boo boo or whatever. Can you please demonstrate some of the sound effects you make? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I used to play with little Star Wars figures when I was a kid, right? Everybody did, I hope, that's my sort of age. <laughs> Maybe still do, you know? And, and Just demonstrated. Yes, and so I would always do the sound effects when I would play with them. And then, and then as I've gotten older and you end up talking with the, like the sound design team, uh, like Eric and Ethan basically, E Squared, did an amazing job with this. And I sometimes, when briefing them, would just do the sounds because I didn't know how to explain it. And then they'd be like, stop, stop, wait, wait, wait. And they'd come and wheel in a microphone, <laughs> go, do it again. <laughs> and then I would do it. And I found out some of them are in the movie. And so like, I, it's really bad stuff, but like, you know, like the- um, Can you please tell us what one of the sounds is? Like the robots, the robot police. I was like, yeah, they should talk to each other. Like they're saying little things to each other, but it should be like binary but it should be kind of like a, a language, but it's like a dial-up modem. And they were like, what do you mean? And, and I didn't, I just like, I don't know, like, like, <laughs> like or something. And, and so they used some of that and, and it, they, they messed around with it and did other things, but some of that's, that's what they're kind of saying to each other, which is like, if you actually understood binary, it's like really bad swear words. <laughs> First of all, I cannot believe you just did that in terms of like, that sounded great. I can understand why they recorded it. I can do a, I, oh man, do we have a bottle? <laughs> I'm ready for the next sound effect, what? I can do a good Darth Vader. But I need a, I need a bottle for it. I can't do it without a bit of, uh, let's not go there. Wait, do we need water or alcohol? No, I just need like a pint glass. Okay. Let's not worry about it. Let's move on. I, I what, actually what think the we, next we should be worried about this and finding the pint glass Disney. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how did This is a spoiler question, but we can now talk about it. How did you decide on the ending, and was it always the ending that's in the movie? It was always the ending. It was, as it, Wow, hang on. Okay, so there is material that's not in there. Let's, but it was always that storyline. Um, it was always, for me... What it was supposed to be, and I thought it was really clear and obvious, but I found out it maybe wasn't. But for me, it was um, that essentially the child um, says, trying to understand death and heaven and the idea of heaven and asks Joshua about it. And he says, it's this place in the sky and then looks at nomads and thinks, oh, is that heaven? 
right? And then later in the movie goes, you realize that uh, Diang Dang, the place they've been heading to um, is actually heaven and that that's where mum is, right? And like, if you, ha if you switch her off, she'll go to heaven, i.e. in the kid's mind, nomad. And so when they go to Nomad, the kid is like, oh, brilliant, mum will be there, right? So then when she looks around and then sees mum, it's like, I knew this would be, yes, it is heaven and there's mum. And so then the idea with the biosphere, with the crops, is Joshua going to heaven at the end, symbolically, and being with his wife. And so that was, oh, that was like, that's the whole reason this movie is doing everything it's doing. So that can never, ever change. Um, but we did have more material. Shall I tell people? I've never talked about it. Uh, go on in, yay! This might, this might be the last q and I ever do for the film, so might, what, what the hell, right? There's a whole section with zero gravity with um, Joshua on the outside of Nomad trying to get back to the shuttle. We just cut him going back into the shuttle because it lasted about five minutes. And there's all this amazing wire work that the stunt team did and, and God bless John David Washington, he did and suffered a lot doing it. Um, and it was really, really cool, but it just felt, every, you know, I would, what it, you can all see it when we do the four hour cut in like <laughs> 2070 that AI will generate for us. <laughs> no, but so, like, so that's a five minute scene of him trying to get back in, but when you're trying to cut a two and a half hour to two hour, that can be something that you take out. Yeah, and it, it makes sense without it. The story works without it. And so those sort of things are the things that have a target on their back to go because because why do you need them, you know? Is the, and there's a lot of things like that, but uh, yeah, that's where we landed with it. Yeah, I, I can understand though why that, when you're trying to cut it down, did you, but even if you had not cut the whole thing down, that's the kind of thing that it's five minutes on the page, but in actuality it might be one minute on screen or like, you know, you have a five minute sequence, but you cut it to one because you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also like a rhythm that's going on at the end and, I don't know, maybe, you know, it's, maybe it'll turn up one day. I don't know, it was, they didn't do the visual effects for it. We, they started on some of it and then we, we pulled it early because we knew it, this is really expensive stuff and if we let this play out and then don't use it, like we've hurt, there's other resources we've used up that w we could use on the rest of the film. So who knows that the creator was really, uh, was titled something else during the, oh, so a few people. So originally it was called, I believe. Scooby-Doo. Or it was called True Love. Um, so how did, and I know you've probably talked about this, but how did you change the title? Why did it change? Uh, the absolute truth is, so it's True Love the entire life of the movie up until the close to the summer it was getting released. And you go to a big meeting about how we're going to market the film. And, and they were basically done research and found that people didn't want to go see a film called True Love, that they thought it was a rom-com. And even with, this, with the poster, with it written on it, they'd be like, what do you think of this film? And they'd be like, rom-com? And they'd be like, N would you go see it? No. And everybody that we needed to see it, that, that group of people, didn't sound like they were gonna go. And so then they tested all these different other names and the creator was the one that we all felt like, well, we could live, that's all right. It's, but it's strange, because I know this film is true love and, that, and some, I stumble saying the creator during publicity. <laughs> It's like your kids transitioned <laughs> and, uh, and it's like now got a new, totally different identity. But I'm curious because you, you really changed the way movies can be made on this. And I'm curious. By the way, sorry, I forgot. Oren Soffer, who's uh, the co-DOP on the film, he got a tattoo of true love. Uh, <laughs> and, and I had to tell him. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, it's not called that anymore. <laughs> and. But he was like, this makes it even better because I'm the only one in the world that'll have it. So he, was, he saw it as a positive. I'm curious, how much are you gonna take what you learned making this film and the way you did visual effects and just the revolution of what's possible to all your future films and how much is it gonna be like on a case by case on what the project needs? I think every film is its own unique thing and you can't just drag and drop. I mean, the whole point of this is I didn't want someone to drag and drop a process onto it and say, 
because what can happen is it feels like there's two spreadsheets, two Excel documents in the film industry. One is low budget, independent spreadsheet, and the other one is like giant blockbuster. And they just when on day one they just change some of the names, and 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 then that's and that's how it begins. And so we were like at the beginning of this, like please start with the independent low budget spreadsheet, and then we will feel like the richest film in the world because we have some money, right? We had good money. If we start with the other stuff, the other end, and then have to cut things out, we're just going to feel paralyzed with. So it was like, so I just think every single film. Given the circumstances, you just go, okay, what? How can we make this feel different? And what can we? And the process is as important as the idea. I think if it's it's as much about how you're going to film something and how you work as it is what you're doing um, to make it feel different. And so, so yeah, I mean, I'm always looking for that. I'm always trying to have it feel like a different type of film when you can. So first of all, I didn't really, usually I get, rat, look, this is supposed to be a 30 minute Q&A. We've clearly gone well, uh, well beyond that. Uh, and I have uh, something else, but uh, just real quick, uh, earlier today, before we end this Q&A, uh, earlier today it might have come out that you could be directing the next Jurassic something movie. <laughs> I was gonna make a joke, but I could, I could see your face. I'm like, uh, so I mean, what, uh, I don't know what I can ask that you can answer. Can you say anything? What are you allowed to say? I honestly, I can't really talk about it. I'm sorry. Um, it's very, very early days, and I, do, I don't know what I can and can't say. Were you a little surprised at the announcement, like that it, got, it came out today, or were you hoping it was gonna be like a week from now? No, I was given a heads up that it might come out very soon. And so I, I tried my damnedest to contact my mum and tell her <laughs> so, before it got on the internet. And I did the same with my sister. I woke my sister up to tell her. And then I, I've left a message for my dad, but it's because of the time difference, he's asleep. So hopefully he won't look on the internet when he wakes up. He's, in, he's not that kind of person that does that. So I can, I can call him in the morning and let him know. What's crazy about this is, so you basically told nobody. Like, who in your life actually knew? Just my girlfriend. That was it. That's crazy. Okay, so just, can I ask, like, what, I know you, you can't say, what, I want to say, I want to ask more, but I don't know what I can actually ask. I guess, are you, nah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, it, it came out that it's, it's starting to film in June. That's what they reported. Can you confirm that? Can you say anything like that? I think the only thing I would say is like, I was about to take a break and I started writing my next idea for a film. And this is the only movie that would make me drop everything like a stone and dive right in. I love Jurassic Park. I think the first movie is a cinematic masterpiece. And Steven, yeah. And Steven Spielberg is 100% the reason I ever wanted to be a film director. So the opportunity, this opportunity is like a dream to me and to work with Frank Marshall and Universal and David Kep, who's writing sure. the script. Um, I think they're all legends. So I'm just very excited and and we'll save all the other stuff for a publicity tour at some point. Yeah, maybe a, a collider screening next summer. Okay, all right. <laughs>